A B-17 bomber limping through the dusk sky over England, 1943. Its engines cough and sputter. The fuselage is riddled with holes, hundreds of them, jagged wounds torn by German flak and machine gun fire. The crew inside barely speaks. They're exhausted, shell-shocked, waiting for the aircraft to simply give up. But it doesn't. The wheels touch down on the runway with a screech of rubber and metal. Ground crews rush forward, and what they see stops them cold. The plane looks like it's been through a metal shredder, wings peppered with punctures, tail section shredded. And yet, somehow, it flew home. One mechanic steps back, shaking his head. This thing should have fallen out of the sky. And he's right. By every measure of logic, physics, and war, this bomber should be a smoking crater somewhere over occupied Europe. But the secret that saved it wasn't found in its armor. It was found in what was missing. The Boeing B-17. Flying Fortress earned its name honestly. Four roaring engines, a wingspan stretching over a hundred feet, 13 machine guns bristling from every angle. It was a castle in the sky, designed to absorb punishment, deliver devastation, and bring its crew home alive. American propaganda loved it. Newsreels back home showed formations of fortresses darkening European skies, unstoppable and defiant. The public believed these machines were invincible. The air crews knew better. By mid-1943, the 8th Air Force was hemorrhaging bombers. Every mission over Germany was a roll of the dice. Flak batteries turned the sky into a wall of shrapnel. Luftwaffe fighters swarmed like hornets. On some raids, one in four bombers didn't return. That's not a statistic. That's a slaughter. And the men who flew them? They lived with a grim calculus. 25 missions to earn a ticket home. Most didn't make it past 10. The military brass knew something had to change. Armor plating had been added early in the war. Steel sheets bolted onto vulnerable areas to protect engines, fuel tanks, crew compartments. But resources were limited. You couldn't armor everything without turning a bomber into a brick that couldn't lift off the runway. So they did what any institution would do. They turned to data, engineers began meticulously documenting every bomber that returned from a mission. They mapped the damage, counted the bullet holes, cataloged where German fire had struck hardest, and a clear pattern emerged. Wings and fuselage peppered with holes, tail sections shredded, engine cowlings dented and torn. The logic seemed obvious. Reinforce those areas. Armor the parts taking the most hits. It was rational. Evidence-based. The kind of decision that gets you promoted. But there was one man who looked at that same data and saw something entirely different. A quiet civilian. A refugee mathematician with wire-rimmed glasses and a soft accent. A man the officers barely acknowledged in their meetings. His name was Abraham. Wald, and he was about to prove that the smartest people in the room had been staring at the answer upside down. Abraham Wald didn't. Looked like someone who'd changed the course of a war. Thin, unassuming, with the careful demeanor of a man who'd learned to make himself small. He'd fled Vienna just ahead of the Nazi occupation, one of the lucky few, a Jewish mathematician with no military rank, no uniform, no swagger. In the hierarchy of wartime Washington, he was nobody. The Statistical Research Group, SRG, had been assembled in 1942, a collection of brilliant minds tasked with solving the military's most complex problems. Wald was assigned to analyze bomber survivability. It was technical work, unglamorous, the kind of assignment you give the quiet guy in the corner while the real decisions get made by men with medals. And the military officers? They tolerated him. Barely. Desk logic, one colonel called it dismissively. This is war, not a classroom. Wald didn't argue. He simply studied the data they gave him. Sheets upon sheets documenting returning bombers, where they'd been hit, how many holes, 
What caliber of ammunition? The patterns were clear, the conclusions seemed obvious, and the Air Force was ready to act. But Wald sat at his desk, pencil in hand, and asked a question no one else had thought to ask. Where were the holes on the planes that didn't come back? It wasn't insubordination. It wasn't arrogance. It was the kind of thinking that only comes from a man trained to see what's absent, to find meaning in the gaps, the silences, the missing data points. He began sketching diagrams, running calculations, testing a hypothesis that seemed, on its surface, completely backward. And when he finally presented his findings to the strategic research group, the room went quiet, not because they understood immediately, but because what he was suggesting sounded insane. You're looking at the survivors, Wald said calmly, pointing to the damage maps, the planes that made it home, but the ones that didn't, those are the ones that can tell you where the armor belongs. He paused, letting it sink in. Armor where the holes aren't. Imagine a graveyard you can never visit, scattered across France, Germany, the Netherlands. Thousands of bombers that never made it home. Crews that never walked away. Aircraft shredded mid-flight, spiraling into forests and fields and the cold waters of the English Channel. Those planes carried the data Wald needed. But they were ghosts. The bombers returning to base the ones the engineers were studying, had been hit in the wings, the fuselage, the tail, and they'd survived. That was the critical word, survived. A plane full of holes in the wings could still fly. A shredded tail section could still steer. The damage looked catastrophic, but it wasn't fatal. So where were the fatal hits? Wald's logic was elegant in its simplicity. If a plane could take damage to certain areas and still make it home, then those areas were, by definition, not critical. The truly vulnerable zones were the ones that showed no damage on returning aircraft. Why? Because any bomber hit in those spots never came home to be counted. It was selection bias made visible. Survivorship bias. The military had been studying a data set that was, by its very nature, incomplete. They were drawing conclusions from a population that had already passed a survival test and ignoring the population that had failed it. The missing bullet holes weren't random. They were a pattern of death. Wald identified the critical zones, cockpit, engines, fuel systems, the areas that, when struck, caused immediate catastrophic failure. No limp back to base, no emergency landing, just a sudden terminal plunge, and those were the exact areas the military had been under-armoring because they didn't see damage there in the data. When Wald presented his findings, the room didn't erupt in applause. It erupted in argument. You want us to armor the parts that aren't getting hit? One officer demanded. Because if they do get hit, Wald replied evenly, you'll never see that plane again. It was counterintuitive. It challenged standard operating procedure. And for some in the room, it felt like an accusation that they'd been reading the data wrong all along, that their decisions had cost lives. But Wald wasn't interested in blame. He was interested in math, and the math didn't care about ego. The question was, would the Air Force listen to a civilian with a chalkboard or trust the instincts of the men who'd been fighting this war from the beginning? For a long, tense moment, no one knew. There's a kind of courage that doesn't involve a cockpit or a gun. It's the courage to stand in a room full of generals and tell them they're wrong. Wald's recommendation was radical. Ignore the damage on returning bombers. Don't reinforce the wings and tails. Instead, add armor to the cockpit, engines, and fuel tanks, the places that showed the least damage in the data. The term forbidden logic wasn't official, but it captured the resistance Wald faced. His approach violated military instinct. It asked leaders to make decisions based on invisible evidence, on planes they'd never see, data they couldn't touch. Some officers feared the political cost. If they followed Wald's advice and losses continued, they'd be blamed for listening to some civilian egghead. 
If they stuck with the conventional approach and it failed, well, at least they'd followed standard procedure. Risk aversion masquerading as caution. But a few key figures in the SRG understood what Wald was saying. And more importantly, they understood the stakes. Every day the Air Force delayed, more crews died in planes armored in all the wrong places. So they tested it, incrementally at first. A handful of bombers retrofitted with Wald's specifications. Armor redirected from the wings and fuselage to the cockpit and engines. The changes were subtle, just a few millimeters of steel in different places. And then those bombers flew into combat. The results didn't come overnight. War doesn't work that way. But over weeks and months, a pattern emerged in the data, one that couldn't be ignored. Bombers armored, according to Wald's method, were coming home at higher rates. Not invincible, not immune, but statistically, measurably more likely to survive a mission. The skeptics went quiet. Wald's forbidden equation became standard doctrine. Armor placement across the entire B-17 fleet was adjusted. Thousands of tons of steel were moved from non-critical areas to vital ones, and the math held dot crews that would have died didn't. Planes that would have been statistics made it home. Chaldean to you because one man learned to see the invisible. Abraham. Wald never wore a uniform, never fired a shot, never flew in one of the bombers his work helped save. And when the war ended, he didn't stick around for parades. He returned to academic life, quietly, almost invisibly, published papers on statistics and decision theory, taught at Columbia University, corresponded with other mathematicians who understood the elegance of what he'd done. But the public? They never knew his name. There were no medals, no newsreels. The bomber crews who came home because of his insight never met him, never knew the equation that had rewritten their odds. In 1950, just five years after the war, Wald died in a plane crash in India. A tragic, bitter irony for a man who'd spent years thinking about how to keep aircraft from falling out of the sky. His obituary in the academic journals was respectful but brief, a footnote in the history of statistics, but what he left behind was more than a wartime trick. It was a lens a way of seeing the world that would ripple far beyond bombers and bullet holes. Wald had formalized survivorship bias, the idea that we overvalue visible success and ignore invisible failure, that the data we see is often the least important data. That absence is information. In the decades since, his insight has been applied everywhere. Medical researchers learn to study patients who don't respond to treatment not just the ones who do. Engineers designing safer cars began asking, where are the fatal impacts not showing up in crash data? Investors learned that studying successful companies alone leads to terrible strategies. You have to study the ones that failed. Two, even modern AI systems grapple with survivorship. Bias, models trained only on successful outcomes that miss the E by two Invisible patterns in what never made it into the dataset Wald didn't just save bombers. He taught the world to see ghosts. Here's the uncomfortable truth. We live in a world built on survivor bias. Every success story you hear, the entrepreneur who made it big, the athlete who beat the odds, the artist who broke through, is a bomber that made it home. Bullet riddled, scarred, but alive to tell the tale and we study them obsessively. We map their bullet holes. We catalog their strategies, their habits, their morning routines. We write books about their grit, their vision, their relentless focus. But we almost never ask about the ones who didn't make it. The entrepreneurs with the same work ethic who went bankrupt. The athletes with the same talent who got injured. The artists with the same passion who never got discovered. They're the missing data, the fatal hits, the planes that didn't come home. And ignoring them doesn't just skew our understanding. It can be dangerous. After World War II, 
Wald's method became a cornerstone of operational research, the field that blends statistics, engineering, and strategy. His thinking influenced everything from cold. War defense planning to the design of the space shuttle. NASA engineers used survivorship bias awareness to investigate the Challenger and Columbia disasters, asking not just what failed visibly, but what silent risks had been ignored because previous missions succeeded despite them. In medicine, clinical trials now routinely account for survivorship bias, tracking patients who drop out of studies, recognizing that the ones who complete treatment aren't necessarily representative of everyone who needs it. In business, venture capitalists have learned, some of them, anyway, that studying only successful startups is a recipe for bad investments. The real lessons are in the graveyard of failed companies, the ones that had great ideas, strong teams, and still couldn't make it work. But here's the thing. We still struggle with this because the invisible is hard to study. The absent is hard to measure. The planes that didn't come home don't land on your airfield with convenient data logs. It takes discipline to look for what's missing, to ask the harder question, and it takes a certain kind of mind, curious, skeptical, unafraid of being wrong, to see the pattern in the silence. Abraham Wald had that mind. And because he did, thousands of young men got to see one more sunrise. There's a photograph, grainy, black and white, of a B-17 crew standing in front of their bomber somewhere in England, 1944. Ten young men, barely out of their twenties, grinning despite everything. You can see the patches on the fuselage behind them, bullet holes repaired with riveted metal, evidence of a mission that almost killed them. They don't know it, but the armor that saved their lives was placed there because of a man they'd never meet. A refugee mathematician who asked a simple, impossible question, what am I not seeing? That question changed a war. And in quieter, less dramatic ways, it's still changing the world. Every time a researcher looks at the patients who didn't recover, every time an engineer asks why a system succeeded despite a flaw, not because of its design, every time someone resists the seductive simplicity of studying only the winners, that's Wald's legacy, not a medal or a monument, but a way of thinking, a reminder that the most important data is often the data that isn't there. The next time you see something survive, whether it's a business, a strategy, or even a life, don't just ask how it succeeded. Ask what's missing from the picture. Ask about the planes that didn't come home. Because somewhere in that silence, in those invisible bullet holes, is the truth that might just save the next life.